Well, once again, good morning, church. Good to be with you this morning. As uh, Lewis alluded to earlier on, it'll be the last time in about two months that I will see you, seeing as how I will be disappearing over to South Africa for a little while. So I trust that you will be blessed as we spend a few moments together in the Word. We're in the book of Romans, and uh, in particular, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. But before we do Romans chapter 8, we're going to do an overview of the whole of the book of Romans leading up to that. Because what I want to read to you in Romans 8, you only really catch the force of it, the power of it, when you follow the logic and the progression of the author's thoughts as he goes through chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then boom, 8 sort of explodes in the context of those other chapters. So if all you're doing is reading sort of one chapter at a day, one chapter a day of the book of Romans, you know, like we sometimes do in our devotional time, you can sometimes forget by the time you get to day 8, that's 8 days later, and you've forgotten you know, the power of what he's been building to over the previous days of reading through the previous chapters. So um, just, bow your, just bow your heads right where you are, and we'll ask the Lord to bless us as we go through the word. Father in heaven, I just want to ask you again one more time uh, to speak to your people, to, to speak through your word, to speak with power. Lord, I pray your, that your grace and your strength will, um, will be seen here, will be experienced here and that a heart, a life, will be touched by your presence. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 1, Paul begins with the gospel. And verse 16, verse 16 kind of sets the stage for what's about to happen. He starts off very positively at the beginning of chapter 1 before he moves to what might be construed as something rather negative in the last part of chapter 1. And uh, verse 16, he says the following, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, Paul has done a few remarkable things in this chapter here, in these few verses. Number one, he's brought into focus the two groups he's going to be addressing. He's going to be addressing the Jewish group and the Greek group. Now, the Greek is a catchphrase for everything that's not Jewish. Does that make sense? He was living in the context of the Roman occupation of Israel, and the Romans had taken over from the Grecians, and Alexander the Great had made sure that the world was what we call Hellenized. What does Hellenized mean? It meant that the Greeks were interested in more than just conquering territory. The Greeks were obsessed with their own culture, with their philosophy. And what the Greeks left behind, even after the Romans took over financially and in terms of military power, the Greeks left their culture. And so the world of, in which the Bible is written, the New Testament is written, is what we call the Hellenized world. That means it was under Roman occupation with Greek culture, with Greek logic, with Greek thinking, with Greek philosophy, Aristotle and Plato. Plato and the Greek philosophers that have shaped even the Western world today. We are very much a Hellenized world. Our philosophy today in the Western world is based on the Greek philosophers. And so here, here Paul addresses these two groups. You have the Hebrews who believed in the word of God, who believed in the Old Testament scriptures, and then you had the Greeks, those outside of the Jewish community of faith. And he says, right, you two I'm addressing, and I'm saying to you that Jesus is relevant to both of you. Both of you desperately need the gospel of Christ. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the gift of life both to the Jew and to the Gentile. The other thing that he does is he sets up what's about to come through the rest of the, the, the book of Romans by quoting directly out of the Old Testament. In other words, what Paul is doing is he's saying to his Jewish reader especially, I'm not just going to philosophize with you. I'm not just going to reason with you because for the Greek, that would have been enough. The Greek would be happy to sit around a table with you and just philosophize. But the Hebrew mind was like the Adventist mind. The Hebrew mind wanted scripture. The Hebrew mind wanted to know where does it say so in the word. And so as he begins his discussion addressing both Greek and Hebrew, he gives a Bible verse. And he quotes right out of the heart of the Old Testament. The just shall live by faith. So he has just set the direction for what he's going to try and introduce to the Greek, the philosopher, and what he's going to introduce to the Bible student, the Hebrew mind. Does that make sense? Right. The rest of chapter 1 condemns the Greek. 
The rest of chapter 1 brings the entire non-Jewish world under condemnation. And at this point, the Jewish mind is going, you preach it, Paul. You tell those good-for-nothing non-believers, those philosophers, you tell those hedonistic pleasure seekers, you tell them where it's at. You tell them that they are lost. You tell them that they are with, without, without salvation, without the word, without being obedient to the law, they cannot have life. And Paul sticks it to them. Paul says to them, you are without excuse because even though you don't have the word of God, you have nature. You have the testimony of God's book of revelation. You can look at the world around you and my, you might not be able to tell everything you need to know about nature because nature itself is messed up by sin but you can tell through nature that there is a God, that there is an intelligent designer, that it is not natural selection and chance and randomness you can tell when you look at nature that there is an intelligence and a beauty, there, there are things that defy mere functionality there is, there is something that goes beyond the functionality of the world that says that there is a God and who is this God? and how are you accountable to this God? But instead of, instead of observing and of learning the obvious, the Gentile has turned his back on God, denied everything that nature says about God, degenerating in essence to the point where we are in society today where he speaks about homosexuality and the like. And he says the entire Gentile world is under condemnation because although they didn't have the law, they had enough to know that there is an, in an intelligent creator God. They had enough to know, to arouse a hungering and a searching within their heart, to find out who this God is, to, to pursue him. But instead, they shut down what knowledge and revelation they had and pursued their own sinful pleasure. And therefore, the entire world stands under condemnation. And just at that moment where the Jewish reader in the background is clapping his hands, when the Jewish leader reader in the background is going hallelujah for preaching the straight testimony brother the straight testimony turns on the church the straight testimony comes to the bible believer in chapter 2 and he speaks here in verse 12 he says for as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Or, oh, you see, the law was supposed to be your ticket to heaven. The law was supposed to be the differentiation between you and the worthless Greek. It was supposed to be my holier-than-thou ticket, but what is it? It is my condemnation. It is what points out sin. He goes through chapter 2 pointing out that, in fact, the Jew is under greater condemnation. Why? Because he, knowing the truth, knowing what is right, but living in sin has brought the name of God into disrepute in the eyes of the Greek, in the eyes of the Gentile. So that the world out there, instead of hungering and thirsting for God, blasphemes God on account of the religious who fail, who fail to live authentically in that righteousness. Wow. There's no more clapping. There's no more applause. There's no more crying out for the straight testimony when you get to the end of chapter 2. Because everybody is condemned. The advantage to having the law and having the oracles of God, Paul says, is not that, you, that it makes you better than anybody else. Not that it advantages you in terms of salvation. Your advantage is that you should sense more than anybody else your real need for a savior. Because it's clearer than without that revelation. But that's not how the oracles and the testimony of God were used. At the end of chapter 2, he says in verse 28, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men but from God. Fancy way of saying, hey, if you are trusting in your genealogy, if you think that being born into an Adventist, I mean a Jewish family, that somehow that gets you your ticket to heaven, if you think that somehow belonging to the right community of faith, as important that might be, if you think that's how you get to heaven, by a association you are dead wrong dead wrong you are not saved in association of groups you're not saved by your biology you're not saved by your hereditary genetics you're not saved by your nationality by your linguistic uh, orientation by your cultural orientation you cannot be saved by any of those things but it's about what happens in the heart it's about what happens in the heart what is your heart orientation? Is your heart orientation toward God or away from God? 
Is your heart orientation obviously away from God in, in living like the Gentile? Or is your heart orientation more subtly away from God in making your trust good things in and of themselves by, by, by heading towards the things that God has said, instructed, given for our benefit and making them your God? Both Jew and Gentile stand condemned. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, Paul moves towards his solution, and he says in verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have and all fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins previously committed to demonstrate now at the present time His righteousness that He might be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That is a long sentence. And in essence what Paul is saying is now that we have established that it does not matter whether you are born into the privilege of a godly family having the word of God at your disposal or whether you are born into an ungodly family that knows nothing of God. Now that we know that all stand condemned and have no merit before God. Now that we know that we are all sinners, we are all prepared to understand that God saves us independently of any righteous thing. Very easy for a Gentile to accept who has always lived in ungodliness and is looking for something better. Sometimes more difficult for one who has been born into the privilege of a good family, who lives with good people, who believes that doing good things are important. And Paul says, let me completely rubbish that concept for you in terms of the basis of your salvation. It doesn't matter what your privileges in this life are. All stand condemned in the eyes of Jesus. All are sinners, whether you know the law and therefore are probably more accountable or whether you do not have the law and are living in ignorance, all stand condemned in the sight of God. Which then brings us to a universal salvation to the problem of sin, suffering, and in, 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 um, imminent death. God becomes man. And as God, he has all the authority and the equality with God. Every right in the universe to substitute for you and I because it is not putting it on some third party victim but as God he makes that choice for himself as man he is one of us and therefore entitled to take our place and what he does on the cross in Jesus God in Christ reconciling the world to ourselves what God does in Christ on the cross is the answer to both Jew and Gentile because all stand condemned and all cannot save themselves but there is one in whom all die we all, Jew and Gentile, die in Christ at the cross. That perfect substitute of God taking humanity into his being. Everything that is you and I in the being of God enables him legitimately and legally to carry our sin upon the cross. To take our judgment upon himself. So that when that human element dies in God, divinity continues. Divinity cannot die, right? But God in Christ, everything that that human being is dies in the very living being of God. Humanity has died in the same way that humanity was lost in Adam. And he gets to that later on in chapter 5. Then in chapter 4. Chapter 4, Paul turns back to his Jewish reader and he anticipates the trouble of their mind. He anticipates the trouble of their mind in accepting that it is not Judaism that saves you. It is not your, your circumcision that saves you. It is not your body of law that saves you. It is not your obedience that saves you. He anticipates that the Jew is going to be very much like the good but nervous Seventh-day Adventist who when they hear about grace goes, but what about obedience? And Paul says, stop the truck. Back up a little bit. Let's go back to the word. 4 verse 1, what then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? 
For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God. There he is. He's doing a Bible study, right? He's quoting right out of the Old Testament. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Jump down to midway through verse 9. He says, For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? And then he answers his question. Certainly not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who what? Believe though they are uncircumcised. Wow, Paul is radical. Paul is insanely crazy radical in his teaching here. What Paul does is he backs up way back to the origin of the Jewish nation. He says, let's go back and see how we were founded. Let's go back and look at our history. And he says, here's the thing. Abraham was once uncircumcised, which made him what? A Gentile. Whoa. Paul is just going to shatter their world. Wait a second. The ones who are the Jews, the ones who are circumcised, the ones who are supposed to be in special relationship with God, were born out of a selection by grace, through faith, on the part of God, coming to Abraham, a Gentile, uncircumcised, and says, Come, follow me, believe my promises. Abraham believes and then is given the law, then becomes obedient. Everything God has ever done with humanity, Old and New Testament, has always been based on grace by faith. And he says, in essence, to the Jew, he says, hey, wake up and smell the roses. Guess what? You are redeemed Gentiles. And you were redeemed on the basis of God's promise, on the basis of God's grace. The very founding of your nation was by grace through faith. You have been saved by grace through faith. The Gentiles outside of the community of faith, therefore, Lord, Logically, can be saved on the same basis and brought into the community of faith. He says, Abraham, your father, even before the Ten Commandments arrived on the scene in Mo by Moses 450 odd years later, the original founding of the Jewish nation, remember that debate that, that, that when they came to Jesus and Jesus kind of upset them and he said, our father is what? Abraham. How can you say that we are lost? Paul latches onto that. Paul says, you are saved as a Jew if you are saved on the basis of Abraham. And Abraham was saved by grace through faith. He believed the promises of God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And then, after he had believed and was received into the right relationship with God, then God gave him a symbol of his right standing, the law, the obedience. But he was saved completely, entirely, without reference to obedience, entirely on the basis of God's promise. Can you understand to the Jewish reader how revolutionary that would be? Some might even call it blasphemous. I mean, this was life-changing, earth-shaking. And our father Abraham was not saved because of what he did, because of what he believed, because of whom he believed. He goes on from chapter 4 to chapter 5. And he applies the principle of chapter 4 to Jesus Christ. Verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of Jesus, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. In essence, what Paul is saying there is, guess what? If you understand 
If you understand that Jesus has loved you while seeing the darkest side of your character, seeing the darkest side of your personality, if you come to the place where you realize that God is not afraid of your sin and your wickedness, that God is not repulsed by your sin and your wickedness, that God has come into this world and taken your sin and your wickedness into his own being, when you understand that, that sin, sin is not master over God, but that God has mastered sin, you, you get what I'm saying by that, right? When you understand that he has overcome sin, that he is not afraid of the, even the parts of you that you are afraid to admit about yourself. When you realize that he has loved you despite that, 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 that therefore you are absolutely secure in his love, that there is nothing you could do, nothing you could say, nothing you could, could possibly think or feel that would turn God away from you if he knew that thing. Because at the cross he didn't only see it, he experienced it. He took it into his being. When you get that, when you actually internalize that fact, then you will understand that there is nothing to fear of the judgment. Why? Because he says, if God loved us while we were sinners... Before we were oriented towards him. If God loved us while we were sinners to the point that he died for us, then how much more through the healing of the relationship that happens through what Jesus does for us, how much more on the day of judgment when fire rains down on those who have refused the reconciling gift to God, from God, when, when, when fire rains down, why would you be afraid of that day when you have already been fully reconciled to God by his death? Do you get that? Why would he rain down fire on you when he died for you? It would make his gift and the cross an absolute foolish mockery to destroy those for whom he died. To destroy those who have received the reconciliation that Jesus offers through the cross. When you are in Christ, when you have received the gift of salvation, when you have chosen to put your faith and your belief in Him like Abraham chose to believe in Him, Abraham becomes your father because Abraham is the father of all those who believe, whether Jew or Gentile. When Abraham is your father, when you are a believer in the salvation of God, then you have security for the future. You have confidence for the future. Listen to this. You look forward to the judgment. You look forward to the judgment. Not in some self-willed, presumptuous, arrogant sense. With great humility and deep appreciation, you look forward to the judgment because the judgment means the end of all sin. The judgment means moving on, finding closure, getting beyond this broken planet with its brokenness in it. The judgment means... The plan of salvation reaches maturity and completion through the eradication of Satan and his friends and the very principle of sin. And in Christ, you are God's friends. You are reconciled. And God's friends do not get punished. Does this make sense? Chapter 6, Paul in essence says, what is the implication of this? What does this mean for us in the way we live? He talks about baptism and the symbolism of that. He says, do you not know, verse 3, that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death. That death we've just been speaking about, that's how we celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's how we identify with it. We go into the water. We are buried in the water. We come up. He went into the grave. He came up out of the earth. We are resurrected to newness of life, right? Therefore, we were buried with him, verse 4, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly also we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. See, Paul goes from the cross to 
where you are saved by grace through faith to saying that in the light of that we live by grace through faith we live as the resurrected we live as citizens of the kingdom to come we live as ambassadors of Christ down here we are not saved on condition of that we are saved on condition of the merits of Jesus but the outworking of that is a radical heart orientation towards God right a reconciliation that means the relationship is healed and if the relationship is healed then how can you live as an enemy of God so that all our right living becomes the fruit of that salvation by grace through faith the healing of that relationship independent of my works but it leads to a change of life why because the relational compass of your life has shifted Instead of fixating on the idolatries of the heart, on the things of the world, on the people of the world, instead of fixating on myself, my heart orientation has shifted towards God. What I see God doing in Christ wins the affection of my heart. It wins the loyalty of my heart. I am reoriented towards God. And someone who has been reoriented towards God, the fancy biblical word is converted, right? When you are reoriented towards God, how can you continue in the sinful ways that were a, a, an evidence or a symptom of a disoriented heart? You see, your outworking of your sin is symptomatic of a heart defection away from God, right? Over the last weeks, we've spoken about that when I've preached, right? You, you, your heart gives rise to your words. You speak what's in your heart. You act out what's in your heart, and you might be able to fake it for a little while in front of people, but you, the way you live when, it, when you're in the dark, when you think no one is looking, will tell you what governs your heart. And the whole point of what happens on the cross is not only the legal side of your forgiveness, but this real sense in which the demonstration of the love of God awakens a love response in me, a love response that turns my heart towards God. And in the same way, in the same way that when you fall in love with the person you eventually marry, that turns your attention away from the others, right? In that same way, when your heart is oriented in the right direction towards God, it's oriented away from the devil and his schemes and the world and the love of the world and everything in the world and the people of the world and even myself. That's Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 7, he comes back to that old topic, that old Jewish topic, that old Adventist topic. What are we saying about this radical relationship to Christ? What, 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 was that, what does that do to the law? Yeah, the law is precious to us. What do, we, do we just discard it? Do we throw it away? What do we do with this thing if this is true, Paul? In Romans chapter 7, he goes into this big discussion about the law and blah, blah, blah. And he eventually comes to the point where he describes the problem with the law. And he says, I don't have a problem with the law. I want you to understand this, Paul says. I am not writing against the law. What I'm writing against is the substitution of the Savior with the law. What I'm writing against is when you think that this gift of the law that God has given to you is your 10-step ladder to heaven. He says that the, the, the problem is not with the law. It's with the misuse and the abuse of the law. It is with the neglect of Christ. It is with the heart disorientation away from Christ toward myself and my works and the law. And he says, you know, he goes through this big thing, which I'm not going to read to you. But this thing, I, 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 I don't understand this. He says, I, I, I see the right thing to do. I do that which is wrong. I, I see the wrong thing to do, and I end up doing the thing that's wrong. And I don't get that because I don't want to do what's wrong. He's, he's describing the state of mind where you and I find ourselves, where we are unsurrendered either completely before Christ or even in your journey with Christ at times. The this, this struggle that we have within ourselves, that we, we, we look into the law of God, we see, we are convicted of mind you, you you learn the right things you learn the wrong things but that cannot save you and it's so frustrating because when you see the right thing you want to do the right thing there's a part of you that goes yes I get that I want that and yet the problem is that within you is the principle of disorientation away from God disconnection from God and when you're disconnected from God it doesn't matter how much is right and how convinced you are when you are disoriented away from God and you are not in right relationship to God not filled with his presence not indwelling not indwelled with his spirit then you are powerless you see you are convicted you agree you go hallelujah and then you fall He says the problem is not with the law. 
The law has its place. The law tells me what sin is. The law tells me I need a savior. The, Lord, the, the, the law uh, completely just blows my, the deception of my heart apart, you know? All that self-justification, all that reasoning, all that making my behaviors okay, all, that, all, all, all the stuff we do to tell us that we're okay. The law cuts straight through all that garbage and goes, it's wrong. It's out of harmony with God. It, it, you are disoriented away from God, but that's as much as it can do for you. In fact, if you have no Savior, the law 